Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We carry forward our discussion on the general principles of law and in this lecture we will have a look at natural justice. What does natural justice mean? It means procedural fairness. We saw before that justice means fairness, having a fair dealing with everybody and natural justice ensures procedural fairness. That is all the procedures have to be fair, all the procedures have to be correct. The procedures should be unbiased. People should not say that the judge has favored somebody or disfavored somebody. So that is procedural fairness. What kinds of things do you have to incorporate in your procedures to ensure that everything is fair and impartial? So natural justice is about procedural fairness. Now this is a counterpart of the American due process. So the American due process means that the constitution of the United States says that we have to follow the due process of law. There are two things. One is a procedure established by law. So by that what we mean is the first thing is procedure established by law. Now this means that by law that is by any statute if a procedure has been established, then the, that procedure has to be followed. The second concept is the due process of law. Now this says that the law is supreme. So any procedure does not have to be followed, but the due process, the correct process of law has to be followed. And natural justice is talking about this thing. It is a counterpart of the American due process. So basically, if you are following natural justice, you are saying that you are following the due process of law, ensuring that there is impartiality, ensuring that there is procedural fairness. So the procedure must be just, fair and reasonable. It has to be just, it has to be fair and you should be able to give reasons for why you chose a particular procedure. What is the objective of natural justice? It is to secure justice by ensuring procedural fairness. We want to ensure that the processes are just by ensuring procedural fairness. Now natural justice is applicable to all the judicial actions. So if you talk about any cases in the judiciary, if there is any suit that is that has been filed and is uh, through uh, and is going through the process if there is any criminal act that is being punished then in all the judicial actions we need to apply natural justice it also applies in all the quasi judicial actions quasi judicial means that these are not judicial actions but they are somewhat judicial actions so here we do not have a judge but we have things like tribunals or arbitration panels who are doing some judicial functions. So they are not 100% judges, but they are people who are a part of the tribunals or panels who are doing something in which they have to perform some judicial actions. And the third is administrative actions. So when we in the bureaucracy, when we take any decisions, when we do any actions, we have to ensure that the processes or the principles of natural justice are followed. So basically natural justice is applicable in all the judicial cases, it is applicable in all the administrative cases and it is applicable in all the quasi judicial processes that comes between judicial and administrative processes. And there are two principles of natural justice. When do we say that natural justice has been done? 
if these two principles have been followed and the first principle is nemo judex in re sua or it's also known as nemo judex in causa sua no judge in own case no one should be a judge in their own cause that is if for instance a judge is taking a, a decision and one of the parties is the son of the judge or is a close relative of the judge so in that case we might say that the judge is biased because a normal person can think that the judge is going to favor his son or his relative or for instance if there is an animosity between two people so people can say that the judge is going to disfavor this person or for instance the judge has an interest in something the judge has bought shares of a company and this judge is now presiding over a case in which this company is involved so in all of these cases people can point a finger so the first principle of natural justice says don't be a judge in your own cause if there is any interest in any matter then you should recuse yourself you should not be a judge there in that process so that is the first principle of natural justice don't be a judge in your own cause or in anything in which there is your interest the second principle of natural justice is ordi alterum partum ordi is to hear alterum is other partum is party hear the other party hear the other side no one should be condemned unheard that is if you are taking a decision then you should hear the other party you should hear what they have to say it's not that you take decisions just based on a complaint so for instance in bureaucracy if somebody brings us a complaint then we do not take a decision that okay this person should be punished no you will have to call that person against whom the complaint has been made you have to give that person a reasonable opportunity to present his or her case so if the if that person comes and says yes sir i did this wrong then you can pronounce him guilty but if that person says no sir i was not there or no sir i did not do this so in that case you'll have to hear both the parties both the parties will present their evidences and so you cannot condemn anybody unheard you have to hear the other party so these are the two principles of national justice don't be a judge in your own case and hear the other party if both of these are followed then we'll say the principles of national justice have been followed in that particular case log uh, lord denning said that we can also represent these two principles as impartiality so the first principle is being impartial if you are partial to anything if you have an interest or if you are against something then you should not be a judge there and the second is fairness be fair to the other party so let us now look at these two principles in more detail nemo judex in re sua is a rule against bias or partiality and it says that decision makers must be free from bias they should be unbiased so in that case what is a bias a bias is a prejudice that is you have made a prior judgment so you have, you are pre pre is prior judice is judgment so it is prior to the uh, you have made a prior judgment about something that this is right or this is wrong if that happens you are biased now this prejudice can be conscious or unconscious and in relation to the party or the issue the judge must be impartial and the case should be decided objectively only on the basis of evidence on record so only on the basis of what was presented during the hearings what was said what documents were there only on the basis of these things you should be giving out a judgment not because you have a preconceived idea about something so this is what the principle says the judge must be impartial 
the case should be decided objectively only on the basis of the evidence on record not because of anything else which means you should not be having any prejudice any preconceived notions the test in this case is a reasonable suspicion of bias or a real likelihood of bias what does that mean you cannot prove whether a judge has a bias or not because the bias is there inside the mind of the judge so that cannot be proved and so the test for bias is a reasonable suspicion of bias what does that mean if there is a person who has all the knowledge about this case will that person say that this judge is biased or not so that is a reasonable suspicion of bias we are not proving bias we just have a reasonable suspicion of the bias we are thinking that there could be a bias or there is a real likelihood of bias so these are the tests how likely is it that the judge may be biased how much reasonable possibility is there for the judge to be biased so that is something that we need to keep in mind a case law here is dimes versus proprietors of grand junction canal and others from 1852 now what are the facts of the case lord cottenham the lord chancellor owned shares in the grand junction canal so here you have this particular company grand junction canal and there is a lord chancellor who is holding shares in this this company is an incorporated body so there is a person who owns shares in a particular company now should this person be a judge in the case so in this particular case the vice chancellor had adjudicated in favor of the company so this person is the lord chancellor the vice chancellor had pronounced in favor of the company so a lower judge has already pronounced in favor of this company and times had challenged that judgment so now that judgment came as appeal to the lord chancellor lord cottenham so he was sitting on appeal against the decision of the vice chancellor what did lord cottenham do he also affirmed the judgment he also ruled in favor of the grand junction canal now this led to another appeal on the grounds that lord chancellor was disqualified to hear the case since he had an interest on being on account of being a shareholder so basically a lower court has pronounced a judgment in the favor of the company the lord chancellor is now sitting on the appeal he also gives the same judgment in favor of the company now the people are challenging his judgment by saying that he had a vested interest so what was held in this case after consultation lord cottenham was disqualified from sitting as a judge in the cause because he had an interest in the suit so when there was an appeal against the decision of lord cottenham then it was held that yes lord cottenham should not be sitting in this case he is disqualified from sitting as a judge now in that particular case lord campbell says no one can suppose that lord cottenham could be in the remotest degree influenced by the interest he had in this concern because lord cottenham is such a virtuous person that there is nobody who would say that just because he has shares so he would favor somebody that is not the case and we are not saying that so no one can suppose that lord cottenham could be in the remotest degree influenced by the interest but even though we do not indict lord cottenham we are not saying that he is biased but even then my lords it is of the last importance that the maxim that no man is to be a judge in his own cause should be held sacred and that is not to be confined to a cause in which he is a party but also applies to a cause in which he has an interest so even though we do not hold him guilty we do not indict him but because there is a reasonable suspicion of bias because somebody can say or somebody has already said that lord cottenham could be biased he could favor the this particular company and so he should not be a judge in this case 
it does not only apply to the case where the judge is a party but also to cases where he has an interest since i have had the honor to be the chief justice of the court of queens bench we have again and again set aside proceedings in inferior tribunals because an individual who had an interest in a cause took part in the decision so again and again for a large number of cases what we have been doing is that in any of the cases that are coming or that have been adjudicated in the lower courts we have again and again set aside the proceedings because an individual who had an interest took part in the decision and now this is a very high court and if we do this this will be a lesson to all inferior tribunals to take care not only that in their decrees they are not influenced by their personal interest but to avoid the appearance of laboring under such an influence so even the appearance of being biased has to be avoided so when we say that what would a common man who has uh, all the facts of the case if that person says that there could be a bias in this person then that person should not be a judge in that particular case and in all of these they are saying that we are not saying that this person is biased but because a common man could say that he is biased so he should refrain from the proceedings that's all that they are saying it was not shown that the decision of lord cottenham was biased in fact the house of lords also affirmed the decrees of the vice chancellor so they also gave the same judgment the house of lords also ruled in the favor of this particular company so there so nothing was done wrong but the only thing is we need to follow this legal principle that no one should be a judge in his own case so that is all so this is a classic case where this particular idea has been propounded now when we talk about biases there are several uh, tests of biases the first one is whether a reasonable man in possession of relevant information would have thought that the bias is likely any reasonable man any common man who is reasonable if he has the relevant information about the case would he think that a bias is likely so this is the classic test of bias in other words lord denning says justice must be rooted in confidence and confidence is destroyed when right minded people go away thinking that the judge is biased that is if you want to do justice there has to be confidence in the public and this confidence gets destroyed if right minded people that is reasonable people go away thinking that the judge is biased so this has to be avoided so this is a classic test of bias another test is to look at the the possibilities or the circumstances of the case to decide if there is actually a bias so you can have a reasonable but you can also look at overt cases of biases where people have already acted in a biased manner so this is another test which looks at the kinds of biases the first one is personal bias as in this case of the honorable supreme court of india in mineral development limited versus the state of bihar and another so this is from 1959 now in this case a person was held to have a personal bias there was political rivalry between the said minister so there is a minister and there is shri raja bahadur kamaksha narayan singh who is the ex landlord of a of ramgarh and sirampur estates in the district of hazaribagh so what happened in this case is that this ex landlord leased some lands to the petitioner so this ex landlord has leased some lands to mineral development limited this company so he has leased some lands to this company and there is a minister in the state of bihar who is having a personal bias against this person against the ex landlord 
so the supreme court says it may therefore be taken that the allegations of personal bias of the revenue minister against the proprietor is not denied so basically if there is any case and if you are said charge on you and if you do not specifically deny that charge if you do not say that the charge is false it is assumed that you agree to it now in this particular case the charge that the minister was biased it was not held to be false nobody nobody denied it so it was accepted so it is taken that the allegations of personal bias of the revenue minister against the proprietor is not denied it is also not disputed that the proceedings against the petitioner were started during the tenure of the said revenue minister and that the actual order of cancellation was made by him we have no hesitation in holding that the revenue minister had personal bias against the proprietor and that he was also acting on the belief that the lease was only benami for the said proprietor so he was acting on a belief means that he was having a preconceived bias he was having a prejudice and during his tenure he cancelled the leases because he had these preconceived notions and so it is said that this person has a personal bias it is proven in this particular case we therefore hold that the said revenue minister had personal bias within the meaning of the decisions and he should not have taken part in either initiating the inquiry or in cancelling the license so here the honorable supreme court is saying that because this revenue minister had a personal bias so he had an interest in the case he was against the proprietor and so the best thing would have been that he should not have taken part either in initiating the inquiry or in cancelling the license if you have any interest just stay away now we have seen before that natural justice applies not only in judicial cases but also in quasi judicial and administrative cases and the action of the minister is an administrative order so natural justice has to be followed so this is a kind of bias personal bias another is pecuniary bias pecuniary means relating to money so you can have a bias because of money involved such as this case j mohapatra and another versus the state of odisha and another from 1984 now in this case what had happened was that there was a calamity and because of the calamity it was held that a large number of books in various libraries they have been destroyed and so now new books have to be procured now who is going to select which books are going to be procured so in this particular case many committees were formed so let us say that there are these three committees a b and c and all of these committees have members who themselves are authors so what can happen in such a case is that a recommends the books that are written by members of b this committee recommends the books that are written by members of c and c recommends the books that are written by the members of a so in this case what will happen is it's called the classic case of you scratch my back i'll scratch yours and there is a very real possibility because there are authors in all three of these committees and basically all these committees are taking up books by these authors only so they are doing a favor but they are not selecting the books of themselves so it is not the case that b committee selected the books of b itself no that did not happen but what happened was that the selection of books for the years 1980 81 and 82 was made in this particular fashion some of the members of the assessment sub committee were themselves authors of books and some of the books written by them were selected and purchased so they had a vested interest because if their books are selected and purchased then they'll get a royalty so there is money involved so there is a reasonable suspicion of a bias because of the money involved thereupon the appellants who are publishers filed a petition under article 226 of the constitution against the state of odisha 
and the director of public instruction odisha to quash the list of books selected for these 3 years and the state government's said decision with respect to purchasing books out of the cyclone and flood, flood relief grant made by the central government inter alia on the ground of bias on the part of some of the members of the assessment subcommittee whose books were sell, uh, were submitted for selection so what is the uh, government of odisha doing here they took out grant in the name of cyclone and flood relief from the central government and out of this grant they are purchasing books and the people in these subcommittees are selecting the books of each other so this is a very good example of a pecuniary bias a money bias another kind of a bias is a subject matter bias as in this case of gulapalli nageshwara rao and others versus the andhra pradesh state road transport corporation from 1959 now what happened in this case was the learned council further contends that the mind of the state government was foreclosed before the hearing was given and therefore no real enquiry was held by it as contemplated by this act so what is happening is the state government of andhra pradesh is nationalizing some uh, public uh, 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 some uh, businesses relating to the plying of buses now if you are doing any administrative action you have to hold hearings so you have to hear the cases of everybody now in this particular case what happened was that the state government first of all decided that we are going to nationalize this thing and then they started the inquiry so basically the whole inquiry was a sham it was just to show that we have done an inquiry there was no actual inquiry because the decision had already been made so the argument is based upon the reports published on 27 1257 in deccan chronicle and golconda patrika therein it was stated that the chief secretary now the chief secretary is the highest ranking bureaucrat in a state so the chief secretary mr mp pai told pressmen today that the government has already taken a decision to nationalize the road transport in krishna district and some routes had been chosen so this decision has already taken place the guntur vijayawada route also comes under the nationalization scheme about 65 buses would be plying on these routes so on 26th of december the chief secretary is saying that these decisions have already been taken the chief secretary was giving this information on 26th of december even before the inquiry was commenced so basically you have not done the inquiry you have first taken the decision if you have taken the decision now it comes under the subject of subject matter bias on the basis of this publication it is contended that the government had already taken a decision to nationalize the road transport before the scheme was approved by the government and that the entire procedure was put through to implement the decision already taken to meet the requirements of technicalities of law now we saw before that natural justice concerns itself with procedural fairness with procedural justice now in this case the procedure was not followed and so this is violative of natural justice so there is a bias another kind of bias is a departmental bias as in this case of uh, uh, messrs krishna bus service private limited versus the state of haryana so this is again from the honorable supreme court in 1985 now in this case the judgment reads the general manager of haryana roadways who is a rival in the business to private operators of motor vehicles in the state and is intimately connected with the running of motor vehicles cannot be expected to discharge his duties in a fair and reasonable manner that is the state has its own roadways corporation and you have a general manager now if you if there is a general manager of haryana roadways and this haryana roadways is a rival to the private bus operators so in this case the general manager can have a reasonable suspicion of bias so we can say that there is a reasonable suspicion of bias 
that the general manager is going to favor his own department and is going to act against the private vehicles so in this case an unobstructed operation of the motor vehicles by private owners operating along the same route or routes would naturally affect the earnings of haryana roadways because they are competitors and there is therefore every likelihood of his being overzealous in discharging his duties of stopping a vehicle and in searching seizing and detaining motor vehicles belonging to others and at the same time excessively lenient in the case of vehicles belonging to his own department so what the supreme court is saying here is that you have this haryana roadways and you have the private operators now haryana roadways has a general manager now if this general manager is given the powers to ensure that the vehicles are plying in a correct manner that is the vehicles are road worthy they have all the documentation they have everything if this same person who is the general manager of haryana roadways if he has the power then there is a likelihood that is that he is going to be lenient to the buses of haryana roadways and he is going to be very against the vehicles that are being plied by the private operators this is what the supreme court is saying he there is a very uh, strong likelihood of his being over zealous in discharging his duties of stopping a vehicle and in searching seizing and detaining motor vehicles belonging to others so if it is a private bus then he'll ask his subordinates to search it stop this vehicle search the vehicle seize the vehicle detain the vehicle and so on so he, he there is a very high likelihood that he will use his authority to create hindrances for these private operators and at the same time he will be ex excessively lenient in the case of vehicles belonging to his own department because he also has to show at the end of the day that his department made profits so in this case there is a conflict of interest and this conflict of interest is known as a departmental bias so here again the supreme court said moreover administration must be rooted in confidence and that confidence is destroyed when people begin to think that the officer concerned is biased so here again we are talking about administrative actions but national justice applies in the case of administrative actions and so the officer has to be unbiased and so there should not be a departmental bias another bias is judicial obstinacy obstinacy means that somebody is stubborn that is if somebody has taken a decision the person can say that no my decision is correct whatever happens if a person has this stubbornness then we'll say that that person is obstinate so another kind of bias is judicial obstinacy as in this case of the honorable madhya pradesh high court in balram versus the state of madhya pradesh on 2021 so this is a fairly recent judgment if a judgment is overruled by the higher court the judicial discipline requires that the judge whose judgment is overruled must also submit to that judgment so if there is a judge and his decision has been overruled by a higher court then this judge should also accept that his decision has been overruled he also has to submit to that uh, judgment by the higher court so this is judicial discipline but the judge may have his occasion to reiterate his dogmatic views that is whatever he views he has he has a chance to reiterate it on a particular question of common law or constitutional law but in some other case not in the same case if in the same case the judge goes on saying that whatever i did was correct then it means that that particular judge is obstinate he is showing judicial obstinacy if it is done if he reiterates his views again and again on the same case it would be exhibitive of his bias in his own favor 
to satisfy his egoistic judicial obstinacy. So in this case, we can say that the judge is only working for himself. He is trying to satisfy his ego. So this again is a new kind of bias that should not be there if natural justice is to be followed. So we saw that the test of natural justice, the first principle is that a reasonable person should not think that there is a real likelihood of bias. But at the same time, if there is a case where these biases are seen, then those particular cases have to be overruled. They have to be reheard. Because in those cases, we can say that the natural justice was not followed. The procedure was incorrect. Now, let us look at the second rule of natural justice. Audi alterum partum, here the other party. No decision affecting the interest of a party should be made unless he is given due notice and afforded a reasonable opportunity of being heard. So two important elements are notice. You have to give a due notice. You have to tell the person what is the charge? What are the documents that are going to be used against you? Who are the people who are going to uh, speak against you? So that all comprises a due notice. And you also have to give a reasonable opportunity of being heard. That is, you cannot say that, okay, this is the list of charges against you, come within 5 minutes. That is not a reasonable opportunity. You have to give some time to the person to look at the documents, to prepare his or her own case. And then you have to give a reasonable opportunity. That is, you cannot say that, okay, you come after one week and I'll give you two minutes. No. It has to be a reasonable opportunity. It should be sufficient time to present his case. And you have to hear, out, hear him out before taking the judgment. So that is the second rule of natural justice. Audi alterum partum, hear the other party. A classic case here is Rex versus the University of Cambridge from 1723. So this is the king or the queen versus University of Cambridge from 1723. What happened in this case was, the University of Cambridge had deprived a scholar of his degree on account of misconduct. So there was a scholar and the University of Cambridge said that because of your misconduct, your degree is now uh, invalid. We are not going to give you your degree. Now the court of kings reinstated him on the grounds that he should not, uh, that he should have been given notice so that he could have defended himself. So in this case, what the University of Cambridge did was that they took the decision without giving the other party a notice and a reasonable opportunity of being heard. So you cannot do that. That is against the laws of natural justice. And it was famously noted that even God in the Garden of Eden did not condemn Adam before he was called upon to make his defense. So people noted that even in the Bible, when we look at the story of the Garden of Eden, so when Adam ate the fruit of the tree, God did not directly punish him. But he was called upon to make his defense. God says, Adam, have you not eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? So even the Bible mentions that God asked Adam, have you eaten the fruit of this tree that I had said that you should not be eating? So that is, God is providing Adam a, an, a reasonable opportunity to present his case. So that is a principle of natural justice. You have to hear the other party. So this hearing comprises of two things. You need to give a notice and a reasonable opportunity of being heard. What should notice contain? It should contain information about the time of hearing, place of hearing, nature of hearing. Legal authority under whom the hearing is to be held, who is going to be the judge in this case. Statement of specific charges that the person has to defend against. You have to provide the list of charges. Specific charges, you cannot be very general here. You cannot say that you have done a misconduct. You will have to say that you have done a misconduct because you did this, this, this. 
it has to be a specific list of charges. So, all of these three together will be there in the notice. Now, the Honorable Supreme Court of India in Union versus uh, in Union of India versus J.P. Mitter held that if the right to be heard is to be a real right which is worth anything, it must con carry with it a right in the accused man to know the case which is made against him. So, he should know what you are charging him of, what is the case against him. That is the statement of specific charges that this person has to defend against. He must know what evidence has been given and what statements have been made affecting him. So, in this notice, you have to provide the list of evidences. You have to provide the list of witnesses that have made statements. What have they said? What evidence has been given? So, that the person can refute those evidences and statements. So, he can give his own proof saying that this evidence is a forced evidence or it is a false evidence or it does not apply to this case or that the statements that have been given by witnesses, probably those witnesses were not there or the statements have been taken under duress. So, n number of things could be there. Now, if the person has to defend his case, he should know what the case is, what are the evidences against him, what are the statements against him and then he must be given a fair opportunity to correct and contradict them a fair opportunity, he should be given sufficient time, sufficient opportunity to correct and contradict these statements and the evidences. So, fairness in disciplinary action means you need to give a clear notice, what is the case? You need to give a right to reply, that is an opportunity to be heard. So, this is the right to reply, the person can say that what what this notice has been given is incorrect. You have to give the opportunity to take legal assistance. So, probably the person does not know the uh, rules of law very well, so he might require a legal assistance. So, you have to give him time and in certain cases, if he does not have access to a lawyer, probably because he is uh, uh, very poor, he cannot afford a lawyer. So, in that case, you also have to give him a lawyer or a person who has sufficient knowledge about such cases, so that his case can also be prepared in a thorough manner. So, the, the opportunity to take legal assistance, it does not necessarily imply legal representation. That is, in a large number of departmental cases, lawyers are not allowed. So, the person has to present his or her own case or the person can take the assistance of one or other officer or employee. So, taking legal assistance does not mean that you will bring a lawyer to the case, but you are uh, you have to provide him the, the opportunity to, to take legal assistance. You have to ensure that the rights that the right to have the case heard without prejudice and there has to be a right to appeal against the decision. Only if all these things are there, then we will say that there has been a fairness in a disciplinary action, else not. Now, natural justice also involves some subsidiary principles. So, apart from the from those two maxims, you also have things like justice should not only be done, but should manifestly and undoubtedly be seen to be done. That is, even if there is some appearance of bias it is sufficient to overturn a judicial decision. Justice should not only be done, it should be seen to be done. Everybody must see that you have done justice. So, there must not be any indication of bias anywhere. It should be seen clearly that justice was done. Orders passed must be speaking orders. What are speaking orders? That provide reasons for the decisions taken. So, in any case, the judge cannot say that I hold him guilty or I let him free. No, it has to be something like I hold him guilty because of these and these reasons. I set him free because of such and such reasons. So, the reasons have to be there. Only if reasons are there, we will say that the order is a speaking order. Otherwise, it is not a speaking order. And one who decides 
must also hear that is the same person who was there in the hearings who has heard the case that person should be giving the decision it cannot be that one judge heard the case then the judge retired or got transferred and now another new judge comes and he pronounces the judgment that should not happen if there is such a case then this particular case will be reheard by the new judge so one who decides must also hear the case now the honorable supreme court has said that speaking orders are necessary in all cases in this case of sn mukherjee versus union of india 1990 so the supreme court says an important consideration which has waited with the court for holding that an administrative authority exercising quasi quasi judicial functions must record the reasons for its decision is that such a decision is subject to the appellate jurisdiction of this court under article 136 of the constitution as well as the supervisory jurisdiction of high courts under article 226 uh, 227 of the constitution and that the reasons if recorded would enable this court or the high courts to effectively exercise the appellate or supervisory power what is the honorable supreme court saying that if there is any administrative decision if there is any quasi judicial function that has been exercised then people have the right to appeal to the high court or the supreme court as per the constitution of india now if a case is brought before the high court or the supreme court how are the high court or supreme court going to decide the case if there are no reasons written if the order just says i hold this person guilty and there are no reasons why did you hold him guilty so it is necessary if not for anything else but because every person has a right to move the high court or the supreme court so it is important it is crucial that all decisions must be speaking orders but this is not the sole consideration this is not the only consideration the other considerations which have also weighted the with the court in taking this view are that the requirement of recording reasons would guarantee consideration by the authority so the it will be a guarantee that the authority devotes time and attention to the case because he or she has to write reasons it will introduce clarity in the decisions so it will be clear why this decision was made and it would minimize chances of arbitrariness in decision making so this is why speaking orders are a must so we looked at national justice with two principles you must not be a judge in your own case and you must hear the other party in all the judicial quasi judicial and administrative actions but now the question is are there situations where natural justice if it is not followed then to it's okay are there such decisions because or, or are there such cases because it has to be applied everywhere so can there be exceptions so let us now look at certain exceptions to the rule such as emergency if something has to be done at that instant like these two cases nathu bhai versus municipal corporation or hyderabad vanaspati versus andhra pradesh state electricity board so we'll look at one case now in this case you have this company messrs hyderabad vanaspati limited and the officials of the andhra pradesh state electricity board they inspected the the factory premises and they note that energy is being stolen and so the power supply was immediately disconnected and a, a provisional assessment was made of 61 lakhs in 1998 and a prosecution was launched now this person hyderabad uh, or the owner of this company he brought the matter to the court saying that these officials cut the power supply but they did not ask me they did not give me an opportunity of being heard so this is a violation of natural justice is that the case now in this case the supreme court held that this is a situation of emergency the principle of nemo judex in causa sua will not apply this person had said two things one these are officers of the electricity board so they are involved in 
this energy business so they should not be doing this job that is the first thing and two they should hear me out now the supreme court said the principle of nemo judex in causa sua or res sua will not apply because these people are similar to income tax or sales tax officials they do not have a vested interest in this energy they are just acting on behalf of the government and because you have done something wrong so as per the rules the electricity has to be immediately disconnected you cannot say that electricity officials should not be disconnecting electricity somebody else has to come because it the matter relates to electricity no and you will also be not given an opportunity to be heard right before the electricity is disconnected because the electricity was disconnected you were given a notice you can always come back and say that no i i have not stolen it or i am ready to uh, give this amount but you cannot hold the principles of natural justice in this case because this is an exigent situation an emergency situation another is confidentiality so in confidential matters you can violate the principles of natural justice as in this case malak singh etc versus the state of punjab and haryana now in this case the name of malak singh was entered in to a surveillance register by the police on the basis of material provided by history sheet whose contents by their very nature have to be confidential it would be contrary to public interest to reveal the information in the history sheet particularly the source of information revelation of the source of information may put the informant in jeopardy so if you tell a person that his name is to be added to a police list and before adding it to the police list you have to to tell him who told the police so in that case the life of the informant would be in jeopardy and so it has to be kept confidential and so the principles of natural justice can be violated here you don't have to ask this person but it does not mean that the police have the license to enter the names of whoever they like or dislike in surveillance register nor can it be used to squeeze the fundamental freedoms so if there is a case of excesses being done then people can approach the court and the court will provide them with relief but it does not mean that entry in a confidential register has to first go through these processes third is impracticability in certain matters it is not practical to follow the principles of natural justice as in this case the honorable supreme court of india in bihar school examination board versus subhash chandra sinha in 1970 now what happened in this case was that while grading the answer sheets it came to the notice that for a particular examination center all the copies were nearly the same all the marks were nearly the same so what the school examination board did was that they Uh, say, uh, they cancelled the exam for this particular uh, center and they scheduled a re-examination. Now people came up before the court saying that we should be given an opportunity before you set up another examination. Now the Supreme Court said that in this case we are not saying that person A or person B has done cheating. The school examination board has just cancelled the examination and has. Uh, scheduled a re-examination. So in this case, it is not practical to call each and every student and ask him, "Did you do cheating or not?" Because we are not indicting any person. So in cases where it is impractical, you can let go. In some cases, it may be necessary not to stick to the principles of national justice, such as this case of Ashok Kumar Yadav versus the state of Haryana. or hiranath mishra versus principal rajendra medical college in the first case there were selections to be made by the public service commission now there were some relatives of the members of the psc who had come for the interview and the members of the psc recused themselves whenever any of their relatives came but then people approached the court that because relatives of some members of the psc were there so 
this interview should be should not be held in this manner now in this case the court held that when two or members of psc are holding a viva they are functioning not as individuals but as the psc of course we must make it clear that when a close relative of a member of the psc is interviewing such member should withdraw from the participation and must not take part in any discussion but if because psc is a statutory body so if one person is removed then another person just cannot take its place only a member can replace another member and because there are not a very large number of members so it is we cannot say that if any um, relative is there then the members of psc should not participate that would become uh, that is against uh, the clause of necessity another case is hiranath mishra and others versus the principal rajendra medical college in this case what happened was there were uh, in, in this medical college there were some students boys who entered into the girls hostel and they 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 did all sorts of uh, mischiefs so there was nuisance that was done by these students now when this happened the principal instituted a committee to look into the matter so the the committee went to the girls took their statements and then the committee called the boys but the committee did not tell the boys who are the girls who told your names and so the boys brought this case to the courts the boys said that we were not given a reasonable opportunity because we were not told who these girls were now in this case the supreme court held that the high court was plainly right in holding that the principles of natural justice are not inflexible and may differ in different circumstances it is not that you have to follow the same formula everywhere and in case of serious matters such as this matter where the safety of girls students living in the hostel is involved you can be a bit more lenient also because the authorities were acting in the place of parents they were in loco parentis they had they were acting in a matter of trust in such matters the police could not be called because uh, if the investigation was started the female students might have acted in out of fright or harm to their reputation would not have cooperated nor was there any inquiry before a regular tribunal feasible because the girls would not have ventured to make their statements in the presence of the people who did the mischief because they would have exposed themselves the college authorities are in no position to protect the girl students outside the college precincts and so the college or the authorities devised a procedure that was just and reasonable which did not expose the identities of the girls the college instituted an inquiry committee with independent members there is uh, no suggestion that uh, these people were not respectable or were not independent they called the girls recorded their statements then the students were called the complaint was explained the written charge was handed over they were asked to present their case and then the committee was not satisfied then the action was taken and in this case the circumstances of the case the requirements of natural justice were fulfilled so it is not necessary just to follow things as per words you can devise your own methods as long as you are impartial and fair another exception is the interim preventive action such as in the case of menka gandhi versus union of india so in this case the passport of menka gandhi was impounded because there was a fright that menka gandhi could move out of the country now in this case the supreme court said that you need not follow all the procedures word by word but you can give or you must give the uh, the uh, opportunity for a remedial hearing that is a hearing after the passport has been impounded so there can be variations another is legislative action so if the legislature by uh, making a statute says that 
principles of national justice are not to be performed in a particular manner, then they are within their authority. So, in essence, there are two principles of natural justice. You should not be a judge in your own case and you should hear the other party. But in a large number of cases, the rules can be bent. So, that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind. Thank you.